Well, hello, Mhotep, and welcome to the Egyptian Magic Podcast. I'm Mark Mark Morgan, a companion of Set and Knight of Shambhala, as I like to say. Today's chat is is about the god Khonsu, the moon deity, which is very appropriate for the time of year. Uh, whose name Konsu means the wanderer, so it's the kind of it's the moon. So this is kind of all about moon magic in ancient Egypt, which is quite an important topic, and I guess quite central to my magical system, really, or, or the system that uh, uh, several of us use, which is based around a kind of cycle, a cosmic cycle, based around the lunar calendar. So kind of Konsu being a lunar deity, not the only one, but is is quite central to to that business. So for the ancient Egyptians, this would be the first month of summer, which even where I am now, it it can feel a bit like that. It was known in the Egyptian tongue or uh, the late version of it as Pachons or Pachons. Uh, which you can break down into an Egyptian word, which is per en consu, in effect. It, maybe you can, passions, it can, it's kind of like a contraction of the per en consu, the one of consu. So it's the month of consu. Very good example of this idea that within the Egyptian worldview, every month of the cycle throughout the year, in lunar months would be dedicated to one particular deity Uh, some of these were replaced and uh, lost uh, as time went on but originally that would be the idea that each each month of the year through the seasons is appropriate for a particular deity and and this deity uh, this month has kind of retained its its uh, deity which is Khonsu. Khonsu as I say is the moon god and the name literally means the wanderer which is an obvious reference to the moon's fast moving and kind of irregular cycle really. Egyptian lunar deities are I would say invariably male. Uh, there are examples Ye- Yael uh, means the moon. Thoth it's kind of male character Horus and Set, which shows, as people have long recognised, that there's no simple equation of males being solar and females being lunar, which sometimes you get within the neo-pagan theology and other theologies as well. Or perhaps that metaphor of uh, male and female, as we say in plus and minus, maybe you'd say for the Egyptians that wasn't quite as important. Uh, it wasn't the only way that they represented sort of this important idea of a binary relationship between things. When you say a binary relationship within the Egyptian culture, a pair of gods, which is a very, very important uh, motif, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be male and female. That That can be important. Just to confuse things as well, even the the categories of male and female are a little bit more flexible within the Egyptian system anyway, and it would be possible to find a male lunar deity who has kind of what are usually thought of as, as uh, female attributes, is able to give birth, for instance. Set gives birth to Thoth, one moon god giving birth to, a, to another one, which is a very interesting piece of mythology, which we probably have to go into somewhere in in the sequence, but uh, we'll leave that for now because it's such a <laughs> rich area. Anyway, the, as I say, that this interplay of important principles it is often, you know, used in met- sexual metaphors, but they can be male female, male male, or female f- female, and other counterparts, and. They can also be sexual, it's just not the kind of strict male-female, it's not the only game in in town. 
But quite a lot of um, interactions between the uh, Egyptian gods are between uh, those nominally of the same gender, male and ma male, or female and female. And the, the, the homoerotic aspect of that, we're not, it's not avoided by the Egyptians, it's just not really thought to be anything you have to comment on. Uh, but the, the, they must have seen that and, and what wasn't it's just part of life as far as they're concerned so for instance Ra who is the nocturnal sun which is another way of referring to the moon uh, in this mythology that as the nocturnal sun the sun at midnight is the moon he has an important union with the underworld deity the lord of the dead Osiris and and when they come together there and form this new entity, there's there's definitely a kind of sexual component to it, you know, very overt sexual component, which they they just didn't really feel that they had to comment on. Maybe they commented on it somewhere else, but not in the sacred texts themselves. So, despite the fact that from time immemorial the month has been dedicated to the moon god Khonsu as as we started there's no actual record for any uh, seasonal rites dedicated to the cult it's so old and has been so replaced that it's it's like it's taken for granted or it's ubiquitous you find that with some of the most important deities within the Egyptian system, there's so much part of it that they're kind of taken for granted. They're ignored. Everybody knows it. That, that's the case with the star goddess Nuit. She doesn't seem to have a dedicated temple, but she's there, implied in everybody else's, every other temple within the Egypt thing. Uh, it could be as well because over time, and then we're talking about long periods of time, the Egyptians actually abandoned or downgraded the ancient lunar calendar that they started out with and replaced it with the calendar that people are f more familiar with in the esoteric world because it's the one that survived up until the Roman era and becomes the basis of the calendar we use as well. Uh, and people try and make it work on a, as a ritual calendar, but it isn't really designed as a ritual calendar as such, uh, for reasons I'm not going to go into now. But Khonsu then is often portrayed as a hawk-headed uh, entity w with a, a human mummy body, a human body which is mummified and a hawk head. So just because he's got a hawk head doesn't mean every deity with a hawk's head or a falcon head is Horus. All, almost all of the gods can be represented in this f important form at, at some point in the mythology. He holds a scepter and a flail, and he has a kind of a hairdo that's fairly well known, a kind of lopsided side lock thing which is symbolic of youth, it said, or can kind a of useful point of view. His headdress will also show the full and the crescent moon in there somewhere, in some form or other. Uh, now the Egyptians often, we talked about binary relationships, so uh, another important relationship would be the triad, uh, uh, a triplet of gods, that's an incredibly important pattern within the Egyptian culture. Uh, most obvious one being, most common, mother, father and offspring. Um, and Khonsu has, becomes part of a tr an important triad as well, with uh, Mut and Amun. He's also treated as a this is the kind of strange thing about Egyptian culture. They can be part of someone else's family and, uh, and tradition and triad or whatever. Or you can become, which is the way it is for some people, uh, the, the whole world, their whole cosmology. And, and this is the way it works within a pantheistic or polytheistic tradition that you might find that for you, one particular deity... Uh, 
is is more important than all the others and they become the center of your universe even though technically there are other pantheons where which are much more important that that is the same even for uh, an entity like set who as it's said for that he had devotees he had disciples uh, disciples and worshippers and priests and temples uh, in the ancient world not much of this has survived for those people who were devotees of his particular cult, he was the centre of their universe as well. We have to kind of assume that. And they would have had versions of all the myths. Everybody seemed to have versions of the myths that they were rewritten from their perspective. And even the the crucial Osiris myth uh, would be rewritten from a, a, a Setian perspective perspective I, I mentioned that because there, there are also with Konsu there are kind of aspects to his ancient cult as far as we know it and his temples uh, that are not dissimilar to the the, the cult of Set uh, or, or has a Setian aspect to to his nature uh, and it's interesting that they're both lunar deities and they're both kind of these they're they can be part of a duality, but they're dual ambiguous within themselves, like the moon. You, know, you might say that that is like the moon as well. As I say, he's famously part of a thing called the Theban triad, Thebes being the Greek name for what we call Luxor or Waset in uh, Aparicia, a very popular place for people to visit. Uh, and there, the Theban triad, he's the son of Amun, uh, who, wh whose name, <laughs> nobody completely sure what it means. Something like the old father, the mysterious one. And his mother is the archetypal mother, a goddess called Mut. Not to be confused with Mayart, although they're spelt very, very similar. Mut is the vulture goddess whose emblem... Uh, Mart's emblem is the ostrich feather, but the vulture goddess would have her own feathers. <coughs> vulture feathers, of course. I suspect that uh, there is some sort of mistaken identity between the two goddesses, the mothers of Khonsu. Uh, and this does crop up, so, you know, you could sort of treat it as a tradition in its own right. But it is very interesting to look not confuse the goddesses Mut and Mart. They have very interesting things in their own right. So as I say, Konsu has a a dark side, the dark side of the moon, if you like. He can be violent uh, and aggressive and uh, something you have to take precautions about. I suppose that's like the moon as well. You know, you always think of the moon as being benign, but it does have, especially the full moon, it does have these um, ambiguous quality to it. In the pyramid text, and we're talking, uh, this is not recent, go back to the earliest written records, the pyramid text. He crops up in a, in one passage which people find quite difficult to place within Egyptian culture, really, which is a thing called the Cannibal Hymn. And literally where there is a notion of cannibalism, cannibalism of each other, but it's a sort of symbolic thing. And usually this is taken as being from an archaic age, from the age before Egypt, because given that these texts are already quite old, you might expect that they're kind of gathering together material from, from their uh, tradition, from their ancestors. Uh, it could be that. It, uh, so so it's, it's a very old practice. Certainly some of the practices of kind of ritual cannibalism or symbolic cannibalism are this kind of hidden undercurrent within Egyptian culture you might say a call it a specialized form of food magic or eating magic it's difficult you can try and place it as something lost in the midst of time but it's it's kind of keeps recurring throughout it never quite goes away as, a, as an idea and the thing it says it can't sue the moon uh is called in the pyramid text 
who slaughters the lords and cuts their throats for the king and takes out for him what is in their bellies. Kansu is the messenger who, who he sends out to chastise people. So Kansu is, you know, got an, a heavy side and he actually goes out, he's sent by the king as a kind of emissary to slaughter people. And this this mo notion of eating each other, you know, this is the gods, the gods are doing this as well, right? The, the, the hymn is quite a long hymn and it, it, it talks about all the different people, you know, that might be different supernatural entities that might be eaten. This isn't really peripheral stuff, either. this is quite uh, important secret aspect to Egyptian culture, this way of this transaction or, or the way things transition from one um, state to another. But certainly the idea that the gods live off each other's energy then, put it that way, by eating each other really, I suppose it's quite a primitive idea, but it's a primitive idea that um, never completely goes away. So as I say, it's a reminder that the moon can be a malign or sinister force within our uh, cosmos. In classical paganism, sometimes people call things white magic or dayside magic. Uh, but in a way, that's probably best done on the dark of the moon, uh, in the secret time, on the new moon. And this, or this would be an ancient point of view then, because they always talk about the best time to do white magic, if you like, or magic to do with the daylight and the sun, is to do it when there is no moon in uh, in the sky in in any of its phases apart from the new moon. It's, it's a, there's a, you've got a phrase for this called uh, in the absence of the moon or in the absence of the seizure of the moon. This might be sort of slightly reverse of what we've kind of come to expect from the kind of first New Age reconstructions of magic. But it kind of, to me, it always made sense you know, that that, uh, that the full moon was such a obvious thing, right? It has this kind of quite kind of moonlight. It's, it's quite spooky in its own way. And... This fits with the kind of ancient idea that it actually can be quite a malign time or or a time when, if depending on what you, sort of magic you want to do, if you want to do kind of night side magic, you need the full moon, not the new moon, the full moon, the light of the moon. If you want to do something in the day or in, to do with the full power of the sun, then you don't really want any phase of the moon to be there, ideally. Sometimes you can't avoid these things, of course. You just have to work with it. Um, so not surprisingly, Konsu is often crops up in curses, usually to both things, to send them or, uh, probably more into kind of guard against them, to reflect them like the moon as a sort of mirror bouncing off any bad vibes coming your way. Every Egyptian child was equipped right from very soon after their birth with a special uh, decree or document uh, written in connection with the moon god. I suppose this is kind of like a horoscope, the origin of the horoscope. It's a combined horoscope, as in an astrological thing, with a, with an amulet. It could be made into an amulet. Uh, um, you get the way that they... They actually would measure the baby and the length of the papyrus used in this uh, script would be the same length as the baby uh, when they're at the point in which they're making this amulet and then they write this long spell on it. They roll it up and they stick it in a special little uh, amulet holder that can then be either worn by the baby or it can be kind of kept close to them to protect them. And it's interesting that this, to read this amulet, which is all connected with a little lot of magic from this sort of stuff. We, Konsu, who was a child, and Konsu, the contriver. So two forms of Konsu, the moon god. Uh, 
these two great living baboons who rest on the right and left of Khonsu in Thebes. So you've almost you've got the the lunar temple of Khonsu, of course, in Karnak, very famous uh, surviving temple with lots of very interesting material connected with it. And on his right and left side, he's got these two entities who are sometimes even represented as, I think this was leopards, really, or of some sort. Leopards being all those powerful cats, you know, wild cats, are, are seen as great personifications of physical, magical power. So his throne would have these two creatures either side of it. It's, it's very, very appropriate. Um, so these are the ones who issue a book of death and life. So the two sides again of the moon, life and death. Uh, and it says in this thing, we shall keep her safe. It's for a woman, a uh, girl this time, the, the, the amulet to protect them. We'll keep her safe from Sekhmet and her son. All right, there you go. So we're going to keep the baby safe from one of the more famous gods of, of Egypt, which is Sekhmet, the lioness goddess. Uh, and her son, right, whoever that might be. Uh, there are various options for that. We're, we're, we shall keep her safe from the collapse of a wall. So we're kind of looking at risk risk assessment now. And from thunderbolts, if there's a storm. So we get a list of different things, but it's interesting it starts with Konsu. So we'll keep us safe from uh, leprosy and from blindness and from the eyes of the undead. Very important. Again, issue within Egypt, the uh, undead and the power of the undead and undead spirits and the whole magic connected with that. Very, very interesting subject in its own right. We'll keep us safe from the seven stars of the Great Bear, from so astrological influences. The Great Bear, of course, is the personification of Set in terms of constellations. We'll keep us safe from the star which falls from the sky, kind of meteorites, I suppose, and which strikes one down, which, you know, more noticeable in uh, the Egyptian area. And we'll keep us safe from the company of heaven and their abominations. So there you go. So the Egyptian, ordinary Egyptian pers person was kind of aware that they kind of needed protection from from the gods <laughs> and the whole company of gods that lives in the temple. So this is not, I mean, this isn't unusual stuff. This is, this is popular folk magic within ancient Egypt. This is the kind of more of an indication of how people actually approach this stuff. It also says we'll keep us safe from the books of the beginning of the year and the books of the end of the year, so special journals kept by the gods in which your name is, is marked. Like Again, it's probably some sort of astrological reference. Okay, so as I say, Kansu can be this cosmological deity uh, there's an example of that in the inner sanctuary of a temple at Karnak. Uh, if anybody's interested, I can sort of show you where this is. I'll try and show you a picture of it. The Karnak, Karnak uh, campus, the uh, sacred site, is absolutely immense. And uh, people are still finding things there that they didn't really know was there, even though it's in a kind of ruined state and only kind of about a quarter of the site is actually open to the public. Uh, another quarter is probably being excavated and another whole bit is one day they'll get around to excavating it. So it's a huge site and it can be difficult to find anything and not all of it has been documented. But in the main uh, hyper hyper style hall on one of the walls there's this cosmology of cosmo uh, of Konsu the moon god and so presumably from the point of view of people who are into into Konsu and it it uses a particular kind of way of looking at the world and it will say you know the the moon the who's called the pillar of heaven in this thing 
the king of Upper and Lower Egypt. To the right of him goes Montu, who enters his left eye on the first lunar day. Then Atum enters his left eye on the second lunar day, Shu enters on the third day, Tefnut on the fourth day, Geb enters on the fifth day, Newt on the sixth day, Thoth enters on the seventh day, and Nephthys on the eighth day. So that's to the right, I suppose. Then it carries on. Uh, Osiris enters the left eye on the ninth day, Isis on the tenth, Horus on the eleventh, Hathor on the twelfth, Solbek on the thirteenth, Shajenet on the fourteenth, and Yunut enters on the fifteenth. So there's fifteen days, which is half a lunar month. And in the final verses, the, this is all written by the, the Queen, Lady of the Two Lands, Cleopatra. May your kindly face be gracious, gracious to me and my beloved son. The sky is clear and the horizon bears the form of the moon so that the left eye can make an illumination for everyone. So it's a kind of a ritual, since it's a ritual text in which we talk about the different components coming together. The personification of the moon, of the moon as a as a uh, I should say that you know the lunar calendar that I'm kind of working with. Uh, people have gone into print to actually deny that it is exists. <laughs> you can't blame people for that. It's not always obvious. I think now it's maybe becoming more well known because partly through my own efforts and other people's efforts of saying well there's this kind of for ritual work there's actually this other tradition with Egypt rather than the one that everybody thinks that they know uh, the 12 months of each month of 30 days each anyway I thought it was particularly important to to deal with the the moon god there's quite a lot of material you know all, all all of the ritual stuff i always say that if you want to worship an egyptian deity the bottom line is if you don't know much about the culture of it, <clears throat> is to just, just do something on the full moon you know you could do other things but that's the kind of bottom line if you at least think about the full moon this would be this is very very common day even within the later calendar they would say oh well they're going to worship Hathor on the 15th day well, because the 15th day or the or the 15th of the month is the is the full moon right? it, it, within the Egyptian system which has 30 days you can also in order to make it more convenient which is the sort of thing the ancients did themselves have a lot of festivals and they have to be moved around and tweaked a little bit to fit with you know other things they've got at least 10 festival days almost in every month 10 days consider that it used to be difficult enough going to a, a full moon ride <laughs> once a month or something like that you know, after a while it feels like quite quite a lot of uh, effort but i suppose if your whole culture is rigged for that sort of thing then it, it becomes easier to kind of at least touch bases so if you've got 30 days you can divide that into three weeks or th uh, three trimesters of 10 days each and this is a common feature a common way of looking at the calendar or the the lunar sequence within the not just the egyptian culture but within the arabic culture and all the rest in fact they have an idea that the the day from the new moon to the 10th is called the rise the rise for obvious reasons the moon is, com is coming up this is in Egypt would have been sacred to the god Horus from his birth on the new moon in the darkness when the torch is, carried, is passed on from his deceased father Osiris to Horus this is all secret stuff so it's, there's no moon it's, it's the dark moon the next period of uh, of 
of the moon the next week is from the 11th to the 20th day and this is known as the white nights and this is particularly sacred to the god set uh, so you don't have to get it all on the one night on the new moon you've got a kind of 10 day window uh, known as the white nights in which you can work magic that would normally be or religion that is normally associated with the full moon period the white night period to make it easier and the final section from day 21 to the 30th day the fall is sacred to the god or osiris for obvious reasons the fall if you like it fits with his descent into the underworld so yeah, and within the White Nights, I, I've always said the day 16, the day, the 16th day, the day after the the main full moon, of, is, is also a very significant day within Egyptian culture and within other parallel cultures as well, from what I call the East-West. From, from Tantra, they'd often talk about this, the, the 16th day. It does have special qualities or astrological features to the 16th day certain things can happen on the 16th day in terms of astronomy that can't happen on other days uh, uh, i believe i'm right in saying okay so uh, before finishing i i say i'm just scratching the surface obviously if you're listening to that you can see that you really if some of these terms are unfamiliar i'll i'll, I'll do what I, I can to kind of uh, spell them out but this is the the basic skills, the work of the the magician in when they're training or learning these things from books or whatever is to kind of start understanding some of the basics of the way the planets and the sun and the moon interact with each other and move and what even just to know. I mean, it sounds silly, but we kind of forget these. Things. You 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 can often sit down for a ritual and think, right. You're supposed to be facing the east, but you haven't actually worked out where the east is in your particular local environment. Um, so you, you have to kind of, you get a mindset for this in the end to sort of check them. It it would Again, it wouldn't be such an unusual feature for the ancient Egyptians themselves who had this issue of w where is east or north or the four directions are very, very important in their system. Uh, and always refer to, but it's not always convenient with a, a building to kind of to orientate it to those four directions. You know, even if you're in control of the situation, there may be local factors, the position of the the river and the geology or whatever that mean that your building can't be exactly four square, and uh, they have a workaround for one. Um, interesting aspect of Egyptian uh, of moon magic that uh, I, I thought I mentioned uh, that you might not have come across I give more details of this in, in the book but this is the uh, the viewing of things called lunar omens omens collecting connected with the moon one of the most common methods of uh, constructing omens in in the ancient world but one of many of course but lunar omens for the egyptians lunar omens are uh, observed um, on the full moon as well uh, which might be different to other uh, systems they they found a, a lunar omen text from the very early period, from the Ramesside period, which could be, say, uh, let's put a number on it, 1350 BC, something like that, a long time ago. I mention that because, obviously, a lot of this sort of material is dominated. People say, oh, it's Babylonian or it's uh, maybe Indian or it's Greek or whatever, but often... The Egyptian innovation is assumed that they've got it from somewhere else. It's, 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 you, you can never be completely certain on that kind of thing. But it, it looks like the yeah that they may have been influenced by Babylonian uh, 
lunar omen texts because they they're much more famous for their lunar omens. They have great textbooks of how to interpret all sorts of omens. But even so, there's there's no obvious reason to to exclude the uh, say the Egyptians may have borrowed some ideas but they may just have come up with their own system that's for how they would have put it funny enough i was looking at one of these this omen text in the library and some famous scholar of the past it's always an interesting thing about real books in libraries have put this kind of note next to it saying where where the text is say always oh, probably from babylon I say well maybe not the egyptians probably wouldn't have agreed to say well we, we, we respect them, um, but we've got our own system. Anyway, so basically, to take a lunar omen, you just go and look at the moon on the, the full moon, and and you take note of the, the you know, because you, do you see the moon just, a, you know, a, a very crystal clear sky, or maybe there are a few clouds in the sky? There might be a, a, a haze that gives it a halo of some sort. There may be some very prominent star very close to it. And all these things enter into the lunar omens, the kind of weird things. And there's a, uh, I've made a tr translation and a version in colour, in fact, that you can see in, probably in the, the ritual year in ancient Egypt, it's got the lunar omen calendar in it. So you can... But most of it is is blank anyway, because the Egyptians, this text is fragmentary, but Egyptians just say, well, these are the sort of things you look for. You make a note of what sort of things. So say, for instance, last night, um, we went out to look at the moon and it was very low on, on the horizon and we could only see it through a kind of web of um, branches of a, of a tree and but at least we could see it, it when, when the summer really gets going and the spring then all that tree will be full of foliage and we won't be able wouldn't have been able to see anything but we did see the the moon quite clearly but with all these kind of tendrils of this uh tree that hasn't woken up yet and that was very distinctive image uh, so that's a kind of omen, really. That's when we saw it. What sort of things are happening in the world just as we speak? Well, not necessarily do we concentrate on the good things or the bad things. There have been kind of mostly bad things have been happening. I suppose I, I, I could mention that, not, not a bad thing, but uh, perhaps significant, that that night... Um, the expert on the tarot and occultism and story writer Rachel Pollock passed away. So perhaps in the kind of technique of ascribing a, a, a good things to an omen. If, you, if you've got a, an omen of some sort, you kind of try and make it come true in the way you want to. And not, not to make it come true, but she'd had a good life and she'd made her contribution, but sadly her time was up. So as that happened, bless her, uh, there was that lunar omen, which I, I think it's, it's for her. It's for, for, in my world, it's, it's for her. So blessed be Rachel Pollack. Uh, you you could uh, another way of doing this is a thing called moon sight meditation, which is a, I think it might be a far eastern Japanese technique that I first heard about it, which is basically you scry the moon. You use the moon as a kind of to, you look at it. Scrying is this thing of looking at the moon. Their their way of doing it, they look at these banners that are painted of the moon because it's very important in their culture and you kind of close your eyes and you open them again and you kind of let it fill your field of vision uh, and you close your eyes and you keep opening and closing them until the after image of this lunar thing is kind of imprinted on your retina in one way or another and then it kind of just more mutates and morphs within your consciousness and gives you all sorts of well you can get good at this you can get you can get whole messages you can get all sorts but certainly you get some interesting images by 
allowing the brain to kind of work in that way. So that's lunar omens. There's a very, very interesting aspect of, of that. So I think I'll kind of finish then with a long press. So coming right up to date, so there's lots of right up to date. I mean, right up to date for me means to the end of the Egyptian culture. You have this collection of um, rituals which people variously call the PGM or magical papyri, which are kind of miniaturized temple rituals. So there are Egyptian uh, temps, things that people did in a temple or around the temple or in their houses, but they say miniaturized as in they couldn't do the full Monty on these things. They kind of come up with a kind of cut down, simplified version that a small number of people can do. Kind of like a chaos magic version of these rituals. But people, technically they call them miniaturized temple rituals, essentially, that uh, so that people can carry on doing the work. And from this, is there are some rather wonderful invocations of uh, of the moon God uh, often involved in calling up spirits to come and some sort of cup meditation so that almost like you're drawing down the moon into this this fluid this is a very ancient practice and and kind of scrying the fluid as well looking at it the moon reflected in the fluid these are all kind of techniques that you have to practice and uh, that people can help you with so I'll finish with that for I am the serpent this is for the invoking Kansu the mood that came forth from the noon from the chaotic waters I'm the proud Ethiopian <clears throat> I am the rearing serpent of real gold there is honey on my lips that which I say then comes to pass I am also Anubis the baby creature I am Isis and I will bind people I am Osiris the drowned who is bound. Thou shalt save me from any danger. Protect me, heal me, give me love, praise and reverence and come into my cup today. All these blessings. Come to me, Isis, mistress of magic, the great sorceress of all the gods. Horus is before me, Nephis is on my diadem. Send the mighty sons of Mihos, send the souls of God, send the souls of man, the souls of the underworld, the souls of the horizon, the spirits of the dead. Send them all into my cup and tell me the truth today concerning that which I am asking about. I summon all your souls and forms to the mouth of my cup. Let them talk with their mouths, let them speak with their lips, let them say about which I ask. Come into me, south, north, west and east, in every breeze of Amenti, for I am the fury of all these gods whose names I have uttered here today. Rouse them for me, the drowned, the dead. Let your soul and your form live for me. Even the fury of Apophis and her daughters I summon from their places of punishment. Let them make me answer to every word about which I am answering here today in truth without falsehood. Therein hasten and come quickly. Bacon